Hi, and welcome to Flant for the Impacts Walking My Shoes member series. This series is carefully curated to ensure we are bringing you interesting and topical discussions from the world of philanthropy, social investment and impact investing. It's our aim to enable you to bring the best support to your clients in their donor journeys and purpose wealth strategies. Today, we're exploring intermediaries and the important role they play in distributing funding and support, supporting societal change. My name is Zofa Zahanik and I'm the Director of Membership and Development here at Philanthropy Impact and the person to talk to if you'd like to know more about our training and how to make the most of your membership with us. You can reach me in the chat or my email is shared at the end if you're watching on our YouTube channel. As always, we will be keeping this discussion strictly to 30 minutes. We do encourage you to use the chat to introduce yourselves and have your say and pose questions to our panel. Our chair for this discussion today is Philanthropy Impact Zone CEO, John Pepin. And joining John, we welcome Miriam van der Elst, who's the Chief Engagement Officer at Epic Foundation, Keith McDonald, who's the Senior Advisor Wealth Management, EY, and Lottie Leaf, who's the founder and CEO of the Jura Society. Thank you all so much for joining today, and I will now pass over to John to make the start. Thanks, John. Sophia, many thanks. Um, before we start the process, I have a message from the chair of our board, Rene Hoare, and from the, uh, our organization. Um, we felt it would be impossible to continue without acknowledging the awful unfolding situation in the Ukraine. In this moment, we are seeing the very worst of humanity, the basis of international norms, sovereignty and safety in Europe and beyond are all being challenged. There is no quick fits. We do believe, however, that in times of great adversity, there can be bright spots of human kindness. It would be an extreme overpromise to say that philanthropy is a solution. It can, however, assist in, um, and alleviate some of the suffering. As philanthropists and as advisors, there's a chance to assist with timely and targeted assistance. Sharing information will be key. Philanthropy Impact is ready to help facilitate this in whatever way we can. It's interesting, uh, but um, uh, we're starting to hear that uh, people are being approached with uh, uh, what's available to help to uh, deal with the Ukraine situation. So I just thought I'd start off with that. Um, so. Um, um, uh, can you each uh, uh, introduce yourselves, who you are, and a bit about your organization, but not too much? Miriam. Hello, John. Hello, everyone. Uh, Miriam van der Elst, Chief Engagement Officer for EPIC, and EPIC is a global nonprofit that aims to empower children and youth around the world. So we are the ultimate intermediary because the job is literally to connect um, people who want donors who want more transparency and accountability in their giving to um, very carefully vetted nonprofits around the world that we spend on average eight months to um, do deal. Uh, and we do so for free because we don't take a percentage or a commission and 100% of the money we fundraise is entirely deployed to the charities we support. Thanks. Um, I should point out, though, that there's a lot of different data platforms that have uh, risen since uh, COVID started and um, uh, connecting philanthropists with, um, um, uh, with places where they can uh, uh, put their money. Um, so Miriam's is really neat the way they do it. Keith, who are you? Uh, yeah, Keith McDonald. Uh, till last year, I was a partner with EY, looking after the wealth management, private banker business. I'm now 50% EY with the glamorous title of senior advisor, which at least hasn't got the word veteran in it, which I was always worried about. Um, <laughs> I've got a range of other roles, uh, including um, being a trustee with John, Farm for Impact, and a, another small charity, and a, a range of other third sector. So I've always been very interested in particularly the wealth management crossover to philanthropy and giving. Uh, for the last seven or so, so years, we've been running a philanthropy forum with a lot of the major wealth managers, private banks on that as well. So seeing the, the broader definition of uh, advisors and intermediaries in this for many years. Thank you. Um, Lottie. Hello, I'm Lottie, founder of the Jura Society. We're a platform focused on three main pillars, which are women, wealth and well-being. And our mission is to empower, educate and encourage women to take control of their wealth whether that's one-on-one -on -one with the uh, coaching, we do consultations with partner and partnerships with non-traditional finance organisations. And it's really bringing this concept of looking after your money to the majority of women out there who maybe don't have 
the uh, the access or the um, you know the the ability to do so as well. Thank you, Keith. Let's start off with you because this is all around intermediaries. What uh, what is your perception of the different types of intermediaries and why do we need them? Okay, I mean it's it's a difficult it's a boil the ocean question really, isn't it? Because it's the um, if you look across global giving and receiving, then it's an incredibly complicated set of processes and parties involved in it. And there's all manner of different types of advisors uh, across that spectrum as well. And if we, if we look at this as you know, philanthropy all the way through investing and through to ESG, then that advisory set gets even broader across consultancies or all sort of different types and forms. Uh, I think from our experience in the last few years, the role of wealth management, private banking is a very major role uh, to, to basically broaden the discussion and to, to start to get those debates going in the right direction with potential givers. Uh, but then if you look, even just look, uh, onshore UK, the last two, three years, there's been some brilliant initiatives to start to increase transparency. Um, everything from uh, Beacon Collaborative that Kath and Matthew have been doing through but, um, things like 360 Giving, um, um, Brevio, Sant Manch and others. They are, they're trying hard to get transparency and consistent data to show the flow of money from givers to receivers. Um, and I suppose, yeah, but for all sorts of reasons, I mean, we, we always have a bit of a tendency for sort of under 12 football with causes where everybody chases after the ball every now and then. Um, so to get an understanding of you know, what's needed across the board, I think needs advisors of all shapes and forms. Um, so I suppose from you know, historically, what from an EY perspective, but you know, broader, we've always looked at this top down at all different types of intermediaries and advisors and how they can help both uh, create smoother processes and understanding, but also support that transparency in the data as well. So it's a part of it having more and better giving, a more and better impact investing, so there's less greenwashing. Yeah, ultimately that's got to be the goal. Yeah, and then you look at some of the inefficiencies in some of the processes. I think it's um, Marcella Brevia. I think she quotes the University of Bath study that says that you know, charities in the UK spend over a billion a year just applying for grants to get money, which is a scary number. Yeah, um, Miriam. Um, your life history is really interesting. So what motivates you? Uh, what do you want to achieve uh, uh, through EPIC or in other ways as well? When we launched seven years ago, um, we wanted to help. We wanted to transform the lives of those children and youth. And we did market research first, trying to identify um, what could be helped. How we, you know, there's 10 million charities out there. There's 175,000 in the UK, numbers diverge, but it's around that. And it's the same in other countries. So when we asked donors what they were looking for, um, when they mean transparency and accountability, what we realized is that there are three obstacles to giving. There's a lack of trust in the use of that money, a lack of uh, knowledge from loads of givers who have a good heart and financial means, but don't necessarily, are not, it doesn't make them expert in any, any case that is close to their heart. And then they also lack of time. Um, we know that people are extremely busy. So we thought instead of being yet another charity, why don't we, you know, there is a place and there's a need for very expert intermediaries. And that's exactly what people would do when they invest their pension money or when you invest your savings, you're gonna turn yourself to a banker or um, an investment fund. Because when there's plethora of options out there, how do you know? And so we thought if we could be that expert um, body in, in between, that would identify organizations and then offer them, um, we might reduce and allevi alleviate some of the um, toxic effects or the negative effects of everyone doing their own things in their own right. So most donors want high scale, high impact, you know, of their giving. But then when hap what happens is individually, they're going to be giving small-ish donations. They're going to restrict the capital, you know, on, on a sort of project funding restricted grant basis. It's going to be short-term donations, sort of one at a time. 
And as a result, you could see that um, charities really struggle because they don't know one year to the next how much they're going to have and whether they're going to have anything. So you've got an inefficient allocation of resources. A lot of the, of the fundraising they receive is donor driven, you know, restricted, for example. And so those charities have a real inability to invest in key areas of growth and sort of, you know, general operations, such as an impact study on the, on the Europe, European continent. You can really see that impact studies tend to be the weaker link in many charities or in IT systems. You know, that's sort of operational things that make you more agile, more efficient and create economies of scale. So that's, that's the before intermediary, I'd say. And I can come back later to the after intermediary. So um, that's telling us why Epic exists to a certain extent, but why why did uh, why did you choose to go this route? Um, and the reason I ask that is that um, uh, uh, being an exemplar um, in terms of what you're trying to accomplish as a person is a really important motivator to other people to do this kind of stuff. So why why do you do this and not do something else? John, you're asking me this because uh, because we've discussed my story. Is it because of how I came to Epic, or it's more about what motivates you? Like, why do you why do you work with Epic? Why why you know what are you fulfilling as a person? That kind of thing. Um, and I do know your story. You're right. It, it, it took me three years to find Epic, and I remember when I came across it, I thought this train is not you know it's not come twice in my life. I wanted to help, and I was willing to give everything um, to the right cause, but I wanted impact. I wanted to be, otherwise, you know, I might as well, I don't know, go to Thailand and have a nice life. I really wanted to make sure that my efforts and the resources and the people I could, I could convince around me would deliver impact. And I've, I've kind of radicalized myself over the seven years thinking, at the beginning, I thought we might as well optimize the return on impact of anyone's money. And now I'm thinking a donor almost has a duty of care because for every 10 pounds that is given that doesn't deliver optimum impact, it's that one child, whether it's today in Ukraine or whether it's a child being abused now, you know, that I can think of that is not being helped. And so, so you know, if you think of the, um, the, uh, the chair of philanthropy from Maastricht who published last year on LinkedIn, something awful, and you have to qualify what they mean by that. 75% of charity money does not deliver impact. Qualify in what they mean by that. And, and I think it's, you know, it, but we know that a lot of money could be better used, could be better pooled, could be, you know, more strategically used. And I really thought if, 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 you, if you work with top organizations, that over deliver on impact, this is a purpose in life. And this is how you can really transform the lives of people who need it. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, yes. And if, as a good follow-up to Keith, I want him uh, suggesting that professional advisors and others, can, as intermediaries can play a big role in uh, more giving and better giving. Um, Lottie, um, Dura Society, uh, that's a bit different from some of the other organizations that we're talking about here. Uh, so what is it and what motivated you to do this, um, to, to this kind of thing? Well, I think similar to, to Mariam, it's that uh, idea of frustration with how things are done and how they can be done better. And when, so I, my background is in wealth management and I was just getting really frustrated with the fact that it's very administrative, it's not very human. And the humans that we're dealing with and not really considered to be individuals and they become part of this process. And so what I wanted to do was to really look under the hood and understand how we can make this relationship between individuals and their money work harder, work better and be more value aligned to the individual who, you know, is stewarding that money. So uh, that's where it started six years ago whilst I was running, you know, my day to day job, as I call it, you know, that, that was my passive income and this was my mission. And so through that, getting the understanding of the network of wealth management, I've, I've really come across some of the, some fantastic individuals in the sea of, you know, of companies and corporates. 
And so I set up Dura Private as an offshoot, which is a private client consultancy to help with these financial transitions, so divorce, bereavement, where the clients are really uncertain. They're really, it's scary, it's daunting. If you have significant levels of wealth, you are vulnerable and you are vulnerable to uh, institutions um, and corporates because they can tell you anything and they can tell a really good story and you will say yes and there's a difference between nodding and understanding but if you want somebody to take control for you you will just ask them and they, you want them to fix your problems right you'll come through a really stressful situation you want someone to fix it and then they're, they're not on your side <laughs> I'm sorry to say a lot of the time it's really helpful to have somebody who's bridging that gap as an intermediary I'm not giving any advice I am helping them to make their decision amongst their advisors. So, you know, I think that that sort of level of, um, you know, of, of individual is really important when you're navigating significant levels of wealth and when you don't have a family office in place and you don't know who to go to and there's lots of moving parts. If you've got tax advisors, you've got art collections, you've got your philanthropic endeavors, who are you going to go to that can wear that hat of being that buffer, of joining the dots of, of adding value, of giving you unbiased, independent and service driven, um, you know, access to these individuals. So it's like having a directory and then having somebody to help you action those decisions on top of it. So that's the private client bit. And then I also do the, the more impact platform driven stuff where it's engaging next gen wealth to take control of their wealth and their money and making these decisions earlier on um yeah to help them to take control really I, I don't know if that makes sense yeah Keith does it make sense to you yeah and I think I mean it's good two superb examples where there's like jigsaw pieces that quite often don't fit necessarily fit together um I, mean, I think one of the you know looking at the particular if we take the last two years out but even before that, a lot of, I promised myself I wouldn't overuse the word transparency, but I'm going to use it again now. This understanding of a spectrum of funding uh, and then the, the war that goes on between charities, the, com the competition for that funding, when quite often it's complementary support of a cause, is where an awful lot of the leakage, and whether it's 75% or not, that the leakage comes out of the system and doesn't go to the cause that it's supposed to be supporting. And I think the last two years has made that much worse because it's you know, a lot of charities have had to bring three year deals down to one year to keep the funding going in current year. It's gone quite onshore compared to international causes. So I think there's good and bad things if good things can come out of the last two years in terms of how, how this has been distorted. Big upsides in terms of corporate purpose and visibility of major causes. Um, but that in itself has made it more complex and advisors need to explain to people the, you know, the connections between family offices, high net worths, their own corporates, if they're owned corporates and corporate foundations, and then how a charity can work with a corporate in half a dozen different ways. It used to be sort of arm's length giving. So, you know, a big company would choose a charity of the year for a year or two and give a load of cash to them. Now there's, it's so it's quite complex in terms of, CSR, coaching involvement of different shapes and forms, interestingly in, in things like education and, and uh, kids, then it's also in terms of jobs and, and future support. So the whole, I think the whole picture has got better in lots of ways in terms of work on making it more transparent and understanding how all these different things fit together. But it needs the advice and support of, of advisors and intermediaries because it because it is that complex a picture now and there is a big change taking place i mean i've noticed it over the last few years as well with advisors and stuff and of course we provide uh training and consultancy to support advisors um uh, to help them understand where their clients are coming from and uh, how to talk to their clients about their values and motivations and ambitions and how to then move forward into uh, supporting them on their philanthropic journey or on the impact ESG uh, journey. So it's really neat uh, to see uh, this happening. Before I go to Miriam, Lottie, are you seeing the, uh, the change as uh, Keith has described? Um, um, and uh, well, just, have you seen that change or is it still 
just coming? Well, luckily, I've, I've kind of moved myself away from that corporate machine. So actually, I'm working a lot more with individuals and understanding what they actually want and what they're looking for. And the beauty of what I can provide for them is really that whole of market service to advisors. So I think um, the individuals that I work with and, and refer to um, would definitely be supportive of this. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, Miriam, um, uh, your approach to being an intermediary is, is, is quite different from Lottie's and, um, and from some of the stuff Keith's talking about in terms of professional advisors. Um, are you involved with professional advisors in your process, but maybe you can also talk about Epic's approach and uh, what its impact is? Um, so when we created Epic, we thought let's be a charity, but rather than an operational charity, let's be a charity that will be the intermediary for free. So um, we actually are worth a sort of $2 million because that's what we cost our board of directors. So when they created us, they said, you know, we would spend 2 million hiring the right people and the right expert. And we created a methodology that's actually reasonably similar to the one of investment funds. Uh, and I used the comparison before. So, we, this methodology is articulated around three, three criteria, which are going to be the leadership, the impact, and the operations. We, we will split them in five KPIs each. We've got 15 KPIs, and every year we will do the due diligence over eight months of about 4,000 charities that come to us on recommendation or cherry picking. And so every year we may have a theme. Um, this year we, said, we um, selected organizations around domestic violence and mental health for children and youth. And a previous year would have been migration issues. So eight months of due deal, 4,000 candidates, we pick between five and 10 every year, and we will commit to staying with them for three years minimum renewable. We will commit to, um, so not only giving them over three years, but also unrestricted money. And we commit to a minimum of 150K, but we tend to go way over from the fundraising. So last year we cost the board of directors 2 million and we raised 10 million. But I think what we're trying to do very much is to create um, sort of um, to prove our theory of change, that there is a real opportunity for charities to be that intermediary, to help donors give much more strategically and what we know is that we did two studies, um, two impact studies among the organizations we've been helping historically, the 48 charities we've supported, but also among the donors. And I'll give you um, numbers. 70% of our donors said that they believe that the donation they've made through Epic has had more impact thanks to our intermediation. And 81% said that it gave them the confidence to donate to nonprofit organizations. So we know we are a trigger, we, we create new donations, but we also know that we've increased the size of the cake of donation. We also know that the increase of the cake of donation has actually benefited charities outside our own portfolio. And then when we look at the charities we've been supporting, 90% said that the way we donate multi-year unrestricted has been transformative and has helped them um, really grow their impact. And that, that's why I think it's even, it's even easier to understand if we're free like us, but I think that's why there's a really strong case for intermediation in charity, something everyone understands in the for-profit investment. Yeah, so there's I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd add to that, Miriam. I mean, I've seen, I've seen what you do at the sharp end as well, and that form of aggregation and simplification and it is, is incredibly valuable. Um, when so much time and effort is spent in the process of charities just trying to get their brand out and the understanding of what they do out. So I think, I think it's a cracking model. And, and we can raise money from other countries and issue a tax receipt to a donor in America who wants to donate. Uh, we, we, we pool resources. We, that allows us to be more strategic. We can issue, you know, we, with taxation, we can be really helpful because we are charities in various countries around the world. Uh, together, you know, it's always the same, isn't it? Alone, you're quicker uh, if you don't get exhausted because it can be dry and, and difficult, but I think together you're stronger. Okay. Um, you talked about unrestricted funding. 
Um, and uh, Keith has mentioned the word transparency. Sorry, Keith. Um, but how, how do you address the transparency and unrestricted funding? Because if you're measuring impact, that means that you're saying to a charity, I might be wrong about this, that we'll give you money to achieve certain outcomes, but you're, you get unrestricted funding. So how do you balance the two? You're on mute, Miriam. Mute. Sorry, I thought it was for Keith. No, it's for you. Okay, sorry. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. <laughs> oh, right. Um, this sometimes. Sorry. Short-term memory loss. Um, and the question was around transparency. Yeah. The balance of transparency, as Keith has mentioned, but also your unrestricted funding. Uh -huh. um, you're still trying to achieve an impact. Yeah. So, how unrestricted is it really? Is it only unrestricted in terms of the means, not the end? Um, how, how does that work? Because there's a lot of unrestricted funding now starting um, because of the whole issue around power, power imbalance between the funder and the recipient. So how do you deal with all that? I'm so grateful you're asking me the question because that's two of my favorite topics. So I'm just, I'm, I'm going to try to be concise, be in my bonnets. Um, restricted. Um, we've been, you know, um, uh, singing the gospel now for six years uh, internationally, and still we can see our donors nodding first, saying, "Yeah, unrestricted is good, unrestricted good," and then they still sometimes say, "Okay, so can I give to that school, you know, in that village because I really care about you know this place." Unrestricted basically means if you've done the due diligence beforehand, really thoroughly and and independently minded. And if you do the monitoring afterwards, which we do, we follow the money and we do three to four monitorings a year. Beforehand, we go and visit the organization. Afterwards, we go and visit the organization. The best way to help a charity is to, to tell them, we trust you, we're on your side. Here is the money and you spend it as and when you want. And COVID has been the torture test of this approach. You could have charities with loads of money in the bank but where they had to pivot because say charity in Vietnam we have is no longer about teaching girls to do hairdos and to cut hair or to prepare food in restaurants. The charity was about delivering baskets of food for their clients and for their clients' family. And so you have plenty of money in the bank, but you, you cannot help the people you serve. That's when restricted. And the only difficulty we have, I would say, the challenge is at the monitoring stage, because we are told a posteriori what the money has been used for. And again and again, we have a massive job to do in terms of teaching the donors that's the smartest way to give. And as far as the power, the, the balance of power is concerned, um, I'm tempted to say even I, as a fundraiser, I'm still being slapped on, on the wrist by our programs team within Epic, keep on telling me that me I am the moment there's a flow of money, you know, going one way, there is going to be a balance of power. And even you as a fundraiser, I'll give you a quick example because I told you I love this topic. Four years of talking to one person who is flying into Europe from the US, private. She has a meeting in France. She's visiting a vineyard. She's got a, a Sotheby's art piece she wants to see. She can stop over in Paris. We've been talking about this charity, which is bang on what she's after. And she can do it on a Saturday from 11 to 12. As a fundraiser, I call the charity in France saying, this is it. She's coming 11 to 12. And the charity says, well, sorry, but the people, you know, our employees and our staff are actually not working on Saturdays. So that's not what they do. And me as a fundraiser, balance of power, I'm like, are you bloody serious? You know, this person is could help this charity and sort out 10%, you know, of their budget. So so to me as an intermediary, with thanks to my programs team, I am the one who can protect the charity and their staff and go back to, to the donor and manage the donor without losing that person. Great, thank you. Um, we're just about out of time because Sophia's come on, but I do have a couple more questions. So Sophia, may I have a couple extra minutes? Um, I mean, of course, but thank we are you. supposed to be strictly 30 minutes, John. 
Yeah, well, um, I'm not always that strict, am I? Um, Lottie, just one quick thing. Uh, the themes you're addressing in your work with women and stuff, can you just give like a 10, 20 second overview of, of some of those things and why it's important to deal with that? Yeah, well, bouncing back to Marianne, the balance of power. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're looking at the major wealth transfer now between the sexes, uh, either through inheritance, divorce, or through, you know, women being able to now work properly, wow, um, and, and make their own money. So utilizing that for the best outcome for them. What, so what themes do we cover? Philanthropy, obviously, um, alternative investments as well. So we're looking at venture capital, we're looking at angel investing, seeing how women can help women by deploying their cash into women run businesses. They so were teaming up with some VCs as well. Because when a client comes to me, I'm really the first, imagine it's going to your GP and then I need to refer out to specialists. That's how it goes. So I can then be like, right, you need to go speak to her, you need to go speak to them, da 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 da. Um, and that is kind of like the beauty and what I love most about it as well. Um, what other things? Yeah, property, NFTs, crypto, you've got to cover that. Anything that is happening in the world of wealth that's going to impact women and yeah, their overall well being. It can be anything from budgeting to inter intergenerational wealth transfers, dealing with IHT. So it's all the kind of like boring technical stuff, but making it engaging and making people want to actually take control of it and, and start asking questions as well. And, and, and saying it's like advisors and, and professionals and not all robots, some are, but, but it, it's allowing them the confidence to go and have conversations with people. Yeah, and that's a bit what we're training does is to have that confidence. Um, Zofia, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. That was, uh, that was super interesting. Um, I'm now going to do the 30 seconds that John likes to do at the end of Wisdom, the takeaway you'd like the audience to walk away with. I'm going to start with you today, Keith, please. As I know you were prepared for this. 30 seconds, I know. No, yeah. I mean, I suppose we covered some interesting ground. I mean, it is, to me, it is this, how do all the different bits fit together? And, and not exactly what you were saying there about advice needs to be comprehensive, not pocketed. Yeah, the classic thing now, that spectrum of philanthropy through social capital, responsible investing all the way through to ESG. Yeah, if, if the advice is just at one end of that spectrum, you can almost uh, reduce the impact of what you're trying to do by how the rest of your money is actually being invested. So I think one of the main things is, is this transparency, and I will use it one last time, of, of the whole, the overall picture, both funding for a cause and all the different parties involved in it. And his favourite phrase at the moment, cause-related networks coming through from Beacon and NPC and others, how you, how you connect the dots, really. I think this is a crucial part of it. Sophia. Sorry, thank you. And um, Lottie, I'll come to you next. Um, what, what my main takeaway is... Uh get down your visions and values. I know that, you know, something that John encourages everybody to do, but, but for individuals who maybe are not at the level yet to be able to action their philanthropic uh, identity for themselves, still you can make decisions with your day-to-day -day spending and your investments and your pensions and everything like that to put that towards a good cause. So understand what you want to identify yourself with your values. Align your money with it. Thank you, Lottie. And over to you, Miriam. Um, if this discussion is about intermediation, I think um, intermediation equals impact. So I think giving is easy. I think um, impact giving is so complicated and, and can be actually totally counterproductive at worst or just useless at best. And I think in, like with anything else, you will ask for advice for you know any other big decision in your life. And as I said, there's almost a duty of care on the donor side to, to optimize the impact of your donation and make sure you, you're doing it right, hence intermediaries. Thank you. Uh, final word to you, John, before we leave for today. I've heard a new term that today, uh, emotional wealth management, and there's training around that. Um, I don't know if you've heard that term, Keith, but um, is that the new thing? Um, I just think it's really important uh, that people support it and, and that they can live their values. Thanks, Lottie, for saying that. I think it's really important. 
Uh, thank you. Sorry, my, my son has literally just come through the door then. Sorry about that. But thank you all for joining. That was a, a brilliant event. And I just want to say that we have announced that we're doing our first face-to-face um, -face event on the 15th of March. That is going to be a free event to everybody. And yeah, <laughs> thank you, Maria. Um, and we're going to be looking at technology, its impact on professional advisors and their clients. There's a panel discussion, but please come and network with us. We're really excited to see you all.